Welcome back, everybody. Thank you all so much. We are now in session two, and uh, this session is about bolstering the interconnectedness of agricultural practices with environmental conservation and socioeconomic equity. Um, I have a, another star-studded set of panelists up front here with me. They've also been given the task of summarizing all that they know, uh, especially as it's relevant to our conversations here at the forum, uh, into eight-minute presentations, which they will do one after the other. Um, and then we'll, of course, open up to questions and answers uh, from you all. So in this session, what we're specifically looking to do is explore how nuclear science and technology solutions can promote equitable access uh, to resources as well as enhance rural livelihoods. We also want to put an emphasis on integrated approaches. Uh, this is where we'll highlight strategies to foster socioeconomic development and sustainable production in agriculture. We also want to showcase country best practices, you'll hear it from some of our panelists up front here, and success stories from both uh, developing and developed countries. Uh, I'm not going to introduce each of them now, but rather as they come up. And the first of our speakers is Mr. Michael Yao Osai. He is the director for the Biotech and Nuclear Research Institute at the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, uh, based in Ghana. And he's going to be presenting about harnessing nuclear science and technology for sustainable agriculture and food security. Yeah. Good afternoon. So, um, all right, so um, we've been hearing the numbers since morning. Um, population is still increasing. Um, net population growth is um, about 50 million and um, currently we have about 8.2 million people, and it keeps growing, and um, there is need to feed the increasing number of mouths that are being added to the population every year. Um, in doing that, um, we've been trying to see how we can uh, transform agriculture, and the current state of agriculture um, is nothing good to write home about. We are not able to feed the number of mouths because we've heard this morning about um, uh, 700 million people go to bed hungry. That means that there is a need to ramp up our productivity. And in ramping up our productivity, we have two options, either to extend the area under production or to intensify how much we get from um, the area that is currently under cultivation. Whichever way we try to go, we are faced with biotic and abiotic stresses like um, pests and diseases, um, poor soils, drought, climate change, and then um, misuse of agrochemicals. Because as we try to get more, we try to keep the pest away, and we, we use all kinds of agrochemicals. We try to increase um, yield by increasing the amount of fertilizer we put in the soil, and all this would, would have impact on, on the environment, will have impact on, on health and other things. And our current focus is more on short-term yields, how we can meet the demands, but sometimes it's important to also focus on sustainability, because sustainability is the way that we can keep the production going and then into the future. Now, we, we have looked at um, the impact of agriculture um, on the environment. Uh, it is, um, we have about 70% uh, of the global fresh water that is being drawn is, um, is for agriculture use. Um, deforestation and overuse of agrochemicals and soil degradation is leading to the loss of biodiversity. We have issues about natural enemies um, um, being wiped out. These natural enemies help us to keep the pest under, um, under control. But if we are wiping them out with uh, agrochemicals, then um, we have issues coming up. We are losing pollinators. Pollinator populations are declining. Um, the soil microbes that are helping us to maintain the quality of the soil, are also being affected. So in going into the future, we need to transform agriculture. And to transform agriculture, it means that we must find a way of producing more to feed the increasing mouths, at the same time to enhance our resilience to climate change, and then also to reduce the environmental footprint of agriculture. And all these are interconnected somehow in the environment and the socioeconomic aspects. So what kind of um, 
options do we have for transforming agriculture? We talk about agroecological practices where we can use um, crop rotation or farming systems to improve um, productivity. Um, we focus on crop nutri nutrition, how to maximize fertilizer use. We focus on pest and disease management and, and other areas, biological control. Or we do regenerative agriculture. So we talked about uh, uh, conservation tillage or no-till, use of cover, cover crops, um, biological nitrogen fixation, and then, of course, integrated pest management. Um, in other areas, we talk about um, secular agriculture, where we try to reuse resources within the system to ensure that um, nothing goes to waste. Or we, lo we look at about climate, climate smart agriculture, where we are looking at um, climate li resilient varieties. What kind of varieties are we bringing in to make sure that we are able to withstand the drought conditions, we are able to withstand climate driven pest situations and other things. We talk about climate information system. How do we incorporate climate information into decision making for farmers so that a farmer knows when the rains are going to start and when it's going to stop so he, he will select his variety to be able to meet that. Let me just mention, uh, focus on two areas. That is uh, crop improvement, where mutation breeding has been useful in developing new varieties. In, in Ghana, we have developed new varieties of cassava using mutation breeding. And these varieties have been able to help us to withstand um, drought conditions, to withstand pests and diseases and, and other varieties, other, other challenges. And then we also are looking at um, area-wide inter integrated pest management, where sterile insect technique um, in Africa has proved useful for managing some insects of economic importance. I just want to focus on the false codling moth control in South Africa, where South Africa, for, since 2007, have been using the sterile insect technique to control um, false codling moth in their citrus industry. And this has contributed significantly to improving citrus production. It has opened up markets for South Africa. And then the people who are into citrus production are able to maintain um, their jobs and their markets. That ripples into social uh, benefits for the country. Now, all these are interconnected somehow. And um, we, we go to the farmer most of the time uh, individually. So as an entomologist, I go with uh, insect pest control solutions. The soil scientist goes with soil improvement solutions. But how can we integrate all these solutions into a package that can be presented to the farmer? So we have, we, have, we have the benefits, but the challenge is that um, our efforts are dis disjointed. How do we coordinate this effort to make sure that we have integrated packages that can be presented to the farmer? In other projects that we run in Africa, we have found ways to bundle these technologies with other social benefits. For example, credit for the farmer to be able to acquire the inputs and, and, and other things. So if we are able to put all this together in a package that is presented to the farmer in a way that he would be able to understand. And one important way of delivering these technologies to the farmer is through participatory farmer demonstrations, where farmers will see these technologies in action and be able to make use of uh, these technologies and help them to adopt it. And the FAO that is a, a, a partner to the IAEA um, is very good with farmer field schools so they have very good technologies for disseminating um, uh, strategies for dis disseminating technologies to farmers in the field. So we can draw on this partnership with the FAO, who would help to disseminate these technologies in the field using the participatory farmer demonstration and farmer field school strategies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Mr. Yao Osai. Our next presentation is going to come from Ms. Paloma Ellitson. She's General Manager for Testing and Inspection. That's the Namibia Standards Institution. Uh, her presentation is about the impacts of agricultural practices and the environmental contamination on food safety. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, contaminants, inorganic contaminants, can find its way into the food chain through various channels. As the slides show you, 
Um, and this can then make food unsafe for human consumption. Now in Namibia, we have a well-established fishery sector and an emerging aquaculture, marine aquaculture sector. And we export food, fish food and shellfish to various international markets, but also regional markets and also to our domestic market. Main products for export from the capture fisheries is chilled fish, frozen fish, and as you probably know, before trade in fish products can be done, countries have to certify through official controls that export-bound foods are safe for consumption. In the case of fishery products, this also includes at the station that it's free from toxic heavy metals, amongst other contaminants. These can include lead, mercury, and cadmium. So I work for the Namibian Standards Institution and we house the National Laboratory for Fishery Products. Um, and we had a real problem. We had severe limitations in capacity for our heavy metal laboratory, which was partly due to aged worn equipment in the laboratory. And this frequently resulted in delay of test results meaning we had to outsource our testing for toxic heavy metals to regional partner countries, and in some cases, abroad. And the impact it had in terms of export for fishery products was that certification of products can be delayed by weeks, with impounded um, outfall to industry in terms of cost as well as to the regulators. So we embarked upon a national project, NAMS 5015, which the target of which was really to capacitate the National uh, Fish Laboratory to perform in-house testing using nuclear techniques, uh, the GFAAS, Atomic Absorption Technique, for cadmium and lead in fishery products. Now you will see my colleagues on the screen demonstrating for you just the few short steps in what this technique entails, sample extraction, uh, digestion of the samples, and eventual instrumental analysis. But what I'd like to highlight on the slide here is that through the project and the setup of the laboratory through equipment and training, but also through the regional project, RAF 5084, uh, which facilitated additional training, but also proficiency testing material, which is critical for laboratories to establish competency and to demonstrate such competency. The laboratory was capacitated and has for the last few years, as illustrated on the slides, been testing 100% of all its samples in-house uh, in terms of 2021 to 2023, you can see the growth in work in the laboratory, uh, but proudly that it was done in the country. So for those who are not chemists, maybe just a short introduction into the GFAS technology. A sample in solution is uh, vaporized, it's atomized, and then uh, uh, exposed to a light source. The light source excites at a specific wavelength the elements, and this is then detected at, uh, by a detector. There's a direct linear relationship between the amount of light that is absorbed by the element and the concentration of analyte present, which means then the laboratory can tell you the concentration of analyte in the sample. So implementation of this uh, technique in the laboratory. What it has meant, as I've indicated, we have now 100% local testing capability, and this has been implemented uh, since 2021, but upgraded in 2022 and onwards. Testing turnaround time for industry, for export purposes, it meant we reduced our certification time 
to seven days, for some samples, 24 hours, that we can move product, especially chilled fish, out of the country at this stage. Laboratory average testing time, three to four days. The Namibian sector that has benefited is mostly the fishing sector, which contributes about 3.4% to the national GDP. And the outfall in terms of secure jobs in the industry um, is quite significant. Uh, Namibia has a small population of 3 million people. We've secured our export markets. We are at this stage growing and moving towards expansion of additional export markets. And we've gone on to build on to the success story. From the fishery sector, we looked at the marine aquaculture sector. And through this testing capability, we are now able to provide routine testing analysis for the shellfish sanitation monitoring program in Namibia, which has very much allowed the regulator to make management decisions around the aquaculture growing areas, but also has secured access for Namibian shellfish to various export markets. Recently, we've upgraded our accreditation status for uh, heavy metals, cadmium, lead, and mercury, to also include the agronomic sector, meaning we are now able to service domestically the, the regulators for the agronomic sector, and meaning they have uh, obtained access to the, uh, international markets, including the European Union for Namibian grapes, dates, as well as various other agronomic products. Now, what has this meant? The outfall has included improved food safety on the domestic scene because, of course, when you set in place the capacity, it falls out to the domestic market. Improved management of the growing waters for aquaculture. Improved information available to the regulators. And overall, economic growth through access to markets for Namibian products. What is next? A month ago, we accredited our ICPMS for trace metal analysis in water. For those working in the food sector, you will know that water is used throughout the food production process. So this was the second important component in terms of the methods, um, the food sector. We've also uh, started working on enhancing our in-house capability for detection of marine algal biotoxins supported by the RAF project. Looking at my time, I will round up quickly to say that looking at the various challenges, laboratory capacity forms one of the key cornerstones in terms of enabling factors to promote food safety on a domestic basis, but also to access international markets because it supports the implementation of national monitoring programs um, as well as decision making. Through the project, we've enhanced laboratory capability and we are looking forward to addressing further enhancement of the laboratory. And we appreciate the efforts of the IAEA as well as the FAO through the assistance of this national project, but also the regional RAF projects and various other efforts that are underway in Namibia in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ellitson, for that example from Namibia. Our next speaker is Mr. Andrew Peel. He's professor at ANSO Australia. That is the Nuclear Science and Technology uh, Group Executive at ANSO. Thank you, and thank you very much for this opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing uh, at ANSTO. ANSTO is Australia's nuclear science and technology organisation and is one of the leading nuclear science and technology organisations uh, in Australia. And one of our key missions is to address the pressing challenges uh, of today. And this is what leads me to this discussion uh, today around food, food security and the application of nuclear science and technology methods uh, in combating 
uh, issues prevalent in food security. So I guess the first question is why use nuclear science and technology methods uh, in food and agriculture? And uh, if you look at the statistics and if you look at the information out there, um, we see that with growing globalisation of food supply chains, this has led to enormous advantages around the world, enormous, enormous opportunities for producers. But of course it also leads to enormous complexities in that supply chain. Uh, and with those complexities comes lots of opportunities for people who want to do less good uh, in those supply chains. And in other words, uh, to contribute to food fraud, for instance, by mislabeling or um, substituting uh, non-appropriate products in the food supply chain. Now, this is estimated worldwide to have impacts in, in the tens of billions of dollars. Uh, this is the loss to uh, primary producers. But in addition to that economic loss, there's significant health impacts uh, from the interaction with uh, non-suitable food products or mislabeled food products. Uh, and it's estimated that of the order of 1.6 million people per year uh, can fall sick through uh, instances of food fraud. And that in turn puts a, uh, a burden on society of tens of billions of dollars in healthcare. As a result of some of this, one of the things the Australian government has done uh, recently is introduced mandatory food labelling uh, or country of origin labelling uh, for all seafood used in hospitality. Uh, I guess one of the classic ways uh, of getting sick is to have some bad seafood uh, at a function. Uh, and by uh, introducing mandatory labelling, that cuts down on some of those tests, uh, some of those risks. So I guess the question then is uh, what, uh, what uh, we bring to bear on food provenance. And uh, ANSTO's, one of ANSTO's key research programs, uh, basically in our environmental uh, area, where we rely on capabilities uh, using nuclear isotope measurement uh, and elemental identification, uh, is to then apply this to food provenance. And of course, the basic idea in food provenance is pretty simple. Um, the old saying is we are what we eat uh, and what we put into uh, organisms, whether they be uh, livestock that we consume, whether it be seafood or indeed whether it be agricultural products taking nutrients up from the ground, they represent a unique uh, fingerprint uh, of uh, elements and isotopes that are often prevalent in that region of origin. Uh, and of course a complication can be where things are farmed uh, that that uh, finger, fingerprint uh, ending up in the product uh, is representative of the food stock uh, that goes into the, um, into the final product. So the way to move this forward uh, is firstly to build up a database of those unique fingerprints, whether that's in the food stock or whether that's in the area of origin. Uh, that's done by uh, pretty simple, basic field work, going out collecting samples uh, and then analysing those samples. And this is where the nuclear science and technology capabilities come in. By having very accurate and well characterised samples, we can rely on the database that we're creating. So in other words, if you go out and sample the soil outside the convention centre here, uh, but you do that with poor tools, then you have a large spread uh, in your um, unique fingerprint of elements and isotopes in that, in that sample. But the better your techniques are, the more refined they are and the more accurate they are, then the more tight your data sets can be. One of the things we then do and have been doing recently at ANSTO is taking those database base sets and applying machine learning uh, to those to then really focus in on what are the key signatures, what are the key uh, indicators uh, that can be used then when looking at samples coming from questioned, uh, for instance, seafood, uh, to then quickly determine and quickly align those back against the database sets. So this is then this ability to identify uh, sampled uh, product. So when this is put into practice, um, what we are developing and what we have developed in recent years is um, what we like to think is a better way, uh, a more efficient and more pra uh, practical way of doing uh, food provenance. Uh, so as I mentioned, 
using techniques like stable isotope analysis to build up accurate database sets, using more conventional things like uh, X-ray fluorescence laboratory uh, measurements, again, to strengthen that. Uh, as I said, using the machine learning to identify key indicators. What that then allows you to do is take a portable device like a handheld scanner uh, into a market uh, and literally point it at samples to quickly uh, register spectrums or spectra uh, that you can then tag back against your database to see whether the seafood that's claimed in, our, in this case, whether it's claimed to be coming from particular uh, regions uh, is in fact correlating against those databases. So that portable scanning capability is one that, uh, again, has been difficult to implement uh, because of the wide uh, set of error bars that can be present in these samples. Uh, but with those uh, more refined databases, with the machine learning uh, in indicators, uh, what we find uh, is that when we go out and do this in practice, again, using scanning techniques, we can actually deliver extremely high accuracy uh, in the sample product. And this is uh, going to be, or this is already, uh, incredibly important because if you're wanting to identify, uh, again, as I mentioned uh, in the seafood case, whether that particular fish is a farmed barramundi in the Australian case or whether it's a wild barramundi, uh, then you can actually identify that quickly using a scanning technique. So this is actually being proved to be uh, useful and as a result, we've been expanding this uh, into other areas of importance in the Indigenous population in Australia. So uh, the Indigenous history in Australia goes back tens of thousands of years with uh, food products that have been refined over that time. One of those products is the Kakadu Plum, uh, which is a massively growing food sector in Australia at the moment. One of the reasons for that is it has the highest vitamin C content of any food product known. Uh, and the uh, market sector is estimated to grow by a factor of three over the next couple of years, which makes it uniquely susceptible to fraud. Um, because if you can grow your kakadu plum in, plum in some other area, in a hothouse uh, in the south of Australia, you're not really passing that, or it's not really properly an indigenous product. But if you can tag that back to locations where the native plum is grown and be able to demonstrate that using these food provenance techniques, then you have a way to support this capability. And then finally, uh, taking this, one of the things we're really keen and have been doing is growing this capability uh, into the region. We're proud to be part, taking part of a collaborative FNCA uh, project, which is um, establishing a federated fingerprint database to prevent food fraud uh, in the Pacific region. So ultimately, the take home message from this is that by using these techniques, by working together, uh, we can actually de de deliver better health and better economic uh, security for regional producers. So thank you for this opportunity to give a short um, demonstration of some of these capabilities and I look forward to further collaborations in future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peel, for that presentation. Uh, our next one is going to be from Mr. Suresh Pillai. He's Professor and Director at the National Centre for e Electron Beam Research, Texas A&M University uh, in the US. His presentation is titled, Beams to Heal, Feed, Protect and Trade. Thank you, Christine, and also thank you to the organizers uh, for the opportunity to present some of my thoughts. Some of my thoughts may be controversial, uh, and the organizers told me to make it controversial so that you could have some questions from the floor. I'm kidding. Uh, so you all see the logo here of the IEEA. It has the same atom and then electrons. So what I'm going to be talking today is about how we harness these electrons to make our lives safer, better, and cheaper. So pardon my uh, attempt at trying to um, kind of make it very simple. Um, if you look at an electric wire, a conducting wire that carries electrons, and this is the same concept we have with electron beam technology for those of you not familiar. We have an electrical wire which carries the electrons uh, at a particular potential. It has uh, several electrons traveling to it. What happens if we accelerate these electrons to almost the speed of light? When we accelerate these electrons to almost the speed of light is when you get electron beam technology. So the advantage of this technology is that there is no radioactive isotopes. 
It is a switch on and switch off technology that uses commercial electricity. This is an extremely important point when we, term, when we talk about communicating the use of nuclear technologies to different parts of the world. And 100 years ago, or over 100 years ago, we developed x-rays using these electrons. Over 100 years ago, we developed uh, the television picture tubes, the old television picture tubes that some of us remember in our parents' homes, where it's the same electrons that are scanning across the phosphorescent screen and creating the images. In electron beam technology, which is shown in the animation below, it's the same electrons, but much more souped up, high energy electrons, and that is used for food pasteurization, food processing, and a lot of industrial applications. So this is the fundamental point I want to emphasize, that it's the way we talk about this technology to our stakeholders makes a huge difference in adoption. Many of us don't even know. We use these technologies, this technology in a day-to-day -day lives. The rubber tires that we drive our cars in, the wires, the insulation in the automobile engines, they're all being cross-linked and strengthened with electron beam technology. So it's not something that we need to introduce to the population. Say, Gee whiz, this is something new. Everybody wears, well, not everybody. Most people wear contact lenses or saline solutions that's all been sterilized with electron beam technology. Bottles with the labels, the colorful labels, they've all been uh, cross-linked with electron beam to make it much more adhesive and without allowing the dyes to penetrate into the food products or the plastic material. So this is extremely important. That this technology is already being used for many, many years. And if you get a colored diamond from your spouse, just don't trust him or her because that colored diamond has actually been made colorized because it was an inferior diamond that was made colored with electron beam technology. And if they don't pay attention to the dose that's applied to these colored diamonds, you can get a brown diamond that is called a chocolate colored diamond, and it's actually too much, it's much more expensive than a regular blue diamond, but you can know it's being done with electron beam technology. So be aware when you get a colored diamond that that's also where electrons have come into place. So the whole issue of using electron beam for healing, cleaning, and feeding, and this is extremely important when we talk about it. In food, it's used for food pasteurization, it is used for pro, uh, protection against pathogens, pests, transboundary transmission of agricultural pests, etc., for global food security, for global food safety, etc. That's just in the food. Then we talk about the environment. It can be used for water treatment. It can be used for soil remediation. It can be used for agricultural enhancement to reclaim agricultural soils. So that's in the environment. And then the non-industrial, the non-food, non-agricultural products, non-environmental products are the industrial products, which can come from bioplastics. It can be used for seed enhancement. It can be used for all sorts of applications, functional polymers, making polymers, make immobilizing bacterial cells or chemicals onto plastics. And then finally, you have the human and animal health, and we had some very interesting presentations earlier on about animal vaccines, uh, sterilizing single-use medical supplies. So once you look at this technology, and this is the same technology that was actually Cobalt-60 has been very, very effective for the past 65 years, or 65 to 70 years. But the time has come for us to move into the newer technologies, which is what electron beam technology is. And when you think about electron beam technology is that it's a platform technology. You don't need to uh, have a different equipment for different applications. If you design the technology properly in the respective countries, you can achieve what you want. So just when you talk about food, it can be used in pre-harvest and it can be used in post-harvest. And these are not theoretical uh, statements. This technology, people are making a lot of money all around the world. There are companies in, the, in Europe that are taking electron beam technology on a mobile platform and sterilizing the surface of the seeds so that they germinate better. There are companies in Australia that are using this technology to export mangoes and other fruits across the borders. It's being done in Pakistan. It's being done in different parts in Vietnam and other parts of the world. And also, if you want to buy aseptic packaging from a company, if you go to Tetra Pak, for example, and you say, I want aseptic packaging, inside that big equipment is electron beam technology. So it is becoming as, uh, what to say, uh, uh, versatile, like your iPhone. You don't need to know what's exactly inside your iPhone, but it's there, the technology is there. And that's what we want to get to in terms of this technology. So this technology, as I mentioned, is commercially available. 
you don't need, it's not a research product. There are a number of global vendors who supply the technology all around the world. It does take a little bit of time to get the technology because it takes some time to build the facilities, et cetera, but it's available all at low energy, medium energy, high energy. It's almost like going into an ice cream store and trying to get the flavor that you want. Depending, and so this is the decision points that you have to make. A country needs to make a decision. What is the technology that we really need right now to have the highest return on investment, biggest social impact, biggest global impact? And so you choose the technology appropriately. So I want to give you two case studies. Pakistan, thanks to USAID, and Pakistan was coming out of a very turbulent political system. They wanted to export mangoes to the United States. USID strategically invested in uh, electron beam technology in Pakistan. And that technology was established in 2018. And what happened was it uh, expanded the use of the technology locally. Also, it expanded the exports of mangoes out of Pakistan. Right after that, in, uh, the government of Pakistan established a facility, electron beam facility in Lahore in 2022. So now you have two e-beam facilities in Pakistan. The other example is Mexico. The government of Mexico has been trying to establish an uh, electron beam facility. But in 2018, a private entrepreneur built an electron beam facility in, in 2018. In 2024, now there are three electron beam facilities in Mexico. I have the numbers. Each of those facilities hires or employs about 50 people. The, pay, the payroll is about $4.8 million, $4 million payroll in that each of those facilities. And just locally, it has created about a 200 to $300 million investment by companies all around that facility. And regionally, at a macro scale, it's almost close to a billion dollars. So we're not talking here about just, oh, improving food safety. It's economic prosperity. And that economic prosperity can solve a lot of global problems. So the technology is expanding rapidly. The two parts of the world that I'm always uh, curious to understand, and my goal in life is actually proliferate this technology all around the world, especially into Africa and into South America, because the people in all these regions deserve prosperity, deserve safe food, deserve secure foods. And you can see what is happening here is that the technology in Southeast Asia is just uh, catching on like wildfire. It's all private investments. These are multi-million dollar projects that have multi-million dollar uh, profit streams. So with that, I think I will end. Uh, the QR code is for my Electron Beam Center website that you can uh, uh, log in and check in. And we'll be happy to answer any questions. We have an Electron Beam workshop in February of 2025. And I invite all of you to attend that if possible. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Much appreciated. Our next presentation is coming from Mr. Zahid Mukhtar. He's Director General for the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission. His presentation is about climate smart agriculture for socioeconomic development. Uh, thank you, Christine, for the introduction. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim So I'll be talking about climate smart agriculture practices for socioeconomic development. A lot have been talked about climate change, which is a threat to global food security, health, and environment. So I'll not talk about the causes and effects, but the way forward. That is, we, we have two options, either to do mitigation or uh, go for adaptation. So in the mitigation also, uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, listening since morning but adaptation is the uh, uh, things we can uh, do and we can uh, develop sm uh, smart agriculture crops, smart crops, uh, climate resilient crops. So uh, in the next, you will see. OK, now uh, if we uh, do mitigation, the more we do mitigation, the less adaptability we have to do, adaptation we have to do. And the less adaptation means less suffering. So in the next slide, you will see that these are the different objectives of smart agriculture. Uh, we have to uh, promote sustainable land water management system, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, 
strengthen food security and nutrition. And uh, through all these approaches, we can enhance uh, crop production. So, but we have some challenges in uh, implementing climate smart agriculture. Like we have knowledge gap, the researchers and the end users, uh, they have uh, 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 knowledge gap. So the things which uh, are developed by the scientists, they are not properly conveyed to the end user. Then we have financial constraints and uh, policy support from the government. So these are all, and the small farmers, they don't have access to the markets. So these are all uh, factors which are uh, challenges for implementing climate smart agriculture. So agriculture and environment are directly uh, related to socioeconomic uh, factors. So they are, all these things, they are interconnected. Like farmers, they are in the third world, especially like in Pakistan, maybe in Africa, we are not getting good quality seed. So farmers usually save their own seed for next cropping. So this is the first step in having a good crop. If you are having a good seed, quality seed, you will get good crop. Then promoting organic practices. Uh, this is with reference to climate, minimizing greenhouse emissions, implementing efficient irrigation system, water use efficiency and fertilizer use efficiency, supporting fair trade practices, improving access to markets to small farmers, education already I have talked, and community engagement. So these are all very important factors. So uh, in Pakistan, we have four agricultural research centers. They are uh, working in different areas, like we are mut uh, doing mutation bedding for crop improvement. Isotope and nuclear techniques are being used for soil water management and crop nutrition. Then we are uh, using these radioisotopes for food and environmental protection, also irradiation for cleaning and uh, for uh, enhancing the shelf life. Then we are using sterile insect technique for uh, uh, these uh, to control insect pests and animal production, we are developing uh, vaccines. So I've been asked to stick just to one topic. That's why I have selected this use of ionizing radiations in agriculture. So they are being used in crop improvement, food safety, plant protection, and animal health. So you can see the benefits that in crop improvement, uh, creation of novel alleles, diverse genetic variability, faster trade development are some of the benefits compared to conventional techniques. In food safety, food availability during national, uh, natural calamities meet international trade requirements for food export because sometimes the food is contaminated, like for example, due to in inappropriate storage conditions, aflatoxins they develop. So you can use irradiation or E-beam as Dr. Pillai has said, that we are using these uh, radiations for cleaning uh, these, uh, 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 these, uh, 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 sorry, mycotoxins. Then we have, uh, uh, talked about this uh, sterile insect, so eco-friendly approaches for pest control, decrease the use of toxic chemical pesticides. So these are all uh, things we are doing at uh, our institutes. Then at the last, uh, you can see that stronger and more specific immune response compared to vaccines produced through chemical inactivation, they can be possible. So we have developed certain vaccines, animal vaccines, using these technologies. So this is one particular example. Uh, a cotton uh, named Niab 78 was uh, the first cotton produced through mutation breeding. And this was the first landmark achievement where the crop production increased from 2.9 million bales to 6.6 .6 or 7 million bales in just two years. So it was more than doubled using this uh, mutation breeding technique. And uh, in the next few years, this crop, this uh, variety covered almost 70% area of total area planted to cotton. 
So this is the uh, biggest example how we have transformed our cotton production in the country. So in 1991-92, uh, it raised to 12.8 million bales due to this NAB 78 single cotton variety. So we are using this for in nine different crops, and so far we have produced 150 crop varieties based on mutation breeding. So in summary, the four agri biotech institutes of PAEC are playing a significant role in the development of and release of high yielding disease resistant and climate smart uh, crop varieties. The research endeavors of plant breeding and genetics have culminated in the release of 150 crop varieties of nine different crops. Nuclear techniques, uh, gamma radiation, fast neutrons, e-beam technology, uh, help create greater genetic variability for evolving novel and improved traits compared to conventional techniques. So these varieties are popular among the farmers and uh, cover a significant area, uh, uh, area planted to these crops and to contribute to the socioeconomic uplift of the country. So uh, the way forward, the way forward is that it usually takes 10 to 12 years to develop a crop variety. So we sometimes, uh, a crop variety once developed, its life is sometimes one to two years because of certain outbreaks, like uh, we developed a uh, cotton variety which was resistant to cotton leaf curl virus, but in the next uh, two years, that became, uh, the resistance was break down. So we had to start the program from zero again. So if we have a, a system where we can develop crops in a shorter period of time, that would be much uh, beneficial for us. So we propose that we should go for speed breeding facility, which can uh, develop varieties within a short period of time. And that will help uh, in evolving crop varieties, to solving the problems which are emergent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mukhtar. And our final presentation for this session is going to come from Ms. Sonia Da Costa, the Director of the Department of Social Technology, Solidarity Economy and Assistive Technology. That's in the Ministry of Science and Technology in Brazil. Her presentation is about family farming as a sustainable model for food security and solidarity economy. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, I want to express my gratitude to for inviting the extended by the International Atomic Energy Agency. The my, my first time here, uh, who are organizing this significant event, scientific scientific forum, Atmos for Food, better agriculture better lives. So, I like it in this conference, uh, general conference. The, uh, the event is de dedicated to first thing, science, collaboration, and demonstration, uh, global scientific mechanisms, activities, and the public, public uh, policies, the designs to support and achievement, achievement the, su the sustainable develop development of agriculture. So, uh, in my talk, I will speak about the science, technology, and innovation for social development, the family farm, as a sustainable model for the food security and the solidarity economy together. Uh, and is, uh, it is connection is the nuclear technology applications. In the line with the objective of this science forum, allow me to share with you uh, some dates on, uh, the, around the world. Um, look, uh, it's visual that uh, the region of the, are the poor and the, the younger. The world has uh, underestimated uh, 733 million of people going hungry in the 2023. 
according to the last global state of food and nutrition security report. In 2022, 33 million people in Brazil faced severed food and nutrition insecurity. And in uh, 2023, this number fell to 8 million people. But it's 8 million people. It's a problem for our country, too. Hungary uh, must be concerned for all the countries and Therefore, the production of food, the sustainable use, the water, and the conservation of the soils and the biodiversity are essential for the continuity, the continuity of the life in the, our planet. We have, I think, in the collaborative way about the technologies and that alternatively we must develop to reduce the impact of the climate change and in our, on our populations and their mitigation of its effect, effects on food production. I have a lot of effects in our country the, because the, the, the change. So we must think about the production times as a world and consider agri-food agri systems that are socially fair, economically viable and sustainable. So this is the context. Brazil has taken uh, the presidency of the Green, uh, the G20, and in your presidents made it clear that Brazil main priority is to stand for them global partnerships, mobilize resource, resource, share technologies and successful experiences in the combating hunger in the, in the poverty, poverty or the rights. Trans Therefore, Brazil propose a global alliance against hunger, the party. This is a, a special moment for, for us in Brazil. Here, uh, we have the social programs of Lula and the, the paper of the family uh, participation in the, the production of food, 70% in Brazil is the family food. Here, uh, we have the mainly projects to support in the with science and technology. Uh, my ministry uh, uh, published the, uh, this college, three important columns, more food for equip equipment and machinery, and food without hunger, and the national plan for organic agriculture. Here, we have uh, an interesting uh, interaction of the uh, irradiation to combat the food waste in Brazil. And the, the waste is a problem for us. We have about, 20, uh, in 2023, uh, 20, I have 41 thousand tons of waste in the food is the waste so we need to think about the new solutions and the uh, atomic and nuclear energy as a possible to resolve this problem in brazil uh, together the our uh, National Commission of Energy and Nuclear Energy, we have uh, some projects uh, in this moment is, a con is, a, is, is happening. So, as application uh, of tropical fruits, radiation of tropical fruits, we have a development of achievements in the rice, for example. We have uh, the 
a molecular uh, diagnostic of a fish, similar in toad. And uh, the other is, uh, for example, the combating of the mosquitoes. And uh, for, uh, for uh, sterile insect technicals. Here, we have the other preoccupation in Brazil, is the question of the water. Is the water in Brazil, there are uh, a lot of contamination. And this, uh, this moment, we has a special research and development about the application for natural uh, isotopes to assist in the implement and magnification and the other secu security in the same area of the region. Uh, until uh, in the other, we have a uh, industrial if, uh, treatment of industrial uh, effluence. Here, uh, we have a unit uh, we uh, support to make these tests. It's a MOVE laboratory. So, this is uh, some uh, initi initiatives that you, uh, my ministry uh, of science, technology, innovation, together the national uh, uh, commission and uh, energy and nuclear, and the other universities. For example, for example, uh, IPEN, USP, uh, EPAGRI, the other Ministry of Agriculture, for example, Embrapa, and UNESP. Is a, today is a invited for the other uh, institutions, national and international, stay together, make a, a network research and development needed together, stay together in this, uh, this, in this process, next actions. So, in the next sessions, for finish, we, uh, together, my ministry has a, a, does next actions, implementing a, implementing a national training residence program for applied uh, research in the uh, nuclear technology in the areas of agriculture, health, environment, and energy. Support for the scientific research and to the application for the, of nuclear technology for development of new, new, new and better pro products and services. Development of equipments and capacity building for technology trans transform to family, fami familiar, family performance by core institution of the sector. And the other question, the finish, I think is so important, the popularization. We need to popularize uh, the uh, research and the, the knowledge about the application of the nuclear technology in different fields. Thank you for your attention, and a special thanks for the Professor Calvo that uh, gave me uh, you have a valuable inputs for this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Da Costa, for that. And thank you again to all the speakers for your presentations. We'll now open up for questions. Uh, this is the final stretch of the day. Uh, but if we have any questions in anything that we've heard uh, thus far, now is the time. We have, we have about 15 minutes for that. So let's be quick on our feet, um, but perhaps while you guys are having a think, I haven't seen anybody's hand go up. Um, I'll start with you, Mr. Yao Ose, because you've been quiet for a while now. You were our first speaker. Um, <laughs> we know that, um, so we have this phenomenon, particularly in, in developing countries, we see that um, there's a low technology adoption among uh, farmers. Um, how can these nuclear-based technologies be presented to farmers for, for wider adoption? Thank you for that question. Um, as I said earlier in my presentation, um, how we package technology and present to the farmer is very important. Um, if you just go to the farmer with um, 
I have technology for improving your soil. And then he has other problems. He applies your technology, he gets the crop growing very well, but insects come to feed on it and he doesn't get a yield. Um, next time you come, he's not going to listen to you. But if we package that technology well mm -hmm. with other incentives that the farmer can, can adopt, it will appeal to the farmer. So if you go with a pest control solution, how accessible is that solution to the farmer? Yeah. Is, it, is it readily available for the farmer to pick on the shelf? So if we say farmers must test their soils, for example, before they apply fertilizer, do we have kits available for the farmer to readily test his soil on the field to be able to know that, mm -hmm. yes, this works? So if we have the te technology well packaged, then we move into the communities where these farmers are, and we, we demonstrate this technology to the farmers because people learn best by seeing or practicing. Mm -hmm. So we have participatory farmer yeah. approach where we can apply this technology in a way that the farmers are seeing the technology in action, then they would, they would adopt it. We have applied it in some other projects that are running currently in Ghana, and there are rippling effects where farmers who are not even part of the program mm -hmm. are adopting the technology because they have seen the, the impact on, on the farms of the people who are adopting those technologies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Pillai, I guess this is in this sort of cell, the same realm. Um, I don't know if this is the answer to the question, but I suspect that one of the challenges you have with adoption with the e-beam technology is perhaps the pricing. Um, maybe that it's too expensive. What would you say to people who say that this technology is too expensive? I think it's on. It should be on. Uh, yeah, so th thank you for the question. So the question is about the question about the price. So as my colleague on the left mentioned, this is a technology that is adopted at the higher end of the value chain of the food industry. It is not to be marketed anywhere close to the farmers. It is actually to the distributors and the retailers. And the price tag on this, if you think about the, uh, I'll just put the, the most extreme case, it's about $20 million. The cost of a refrigerated freezer warehouse is well in excess of $30 million. So when you talk about apples to apples, you need to do an apples to apples comparison. So $20 million also for an investor is very small sum of money compared to what a hotel chain or a resort invests in a country. So we should be very careful that we should never mix in the price. Oh, it's $20 million. Yes, to a government entity or to a private individual, it may be a lot. But to an investment bank or to these, uh, I mean, these large uh, development banks, that type of money is relatively small because the return of investment is very fast and very high. So it's all a question of the value that you put to the dollar that you're investing. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ellison, I would like to ask you about um, some of the institutional and human resource challenges that the Atoms for Food initiative can help address in Namibia. Thank you, Madam Chi. Namibia is relatively a big country, small population. We are spread widely across the country. And keeping to the theme of, of my presentation, which looked at testing capacity, there is a real need for mobile testing capability. We need to take testing to the field and rapid testing technologies. And that is a gap currently in Namibia, which hopefully through a project like Atoms for Food can be addressed. It would bring food safety closer to the people that need it the most, which is the farmers, yeah. the big production warehouses out in the rural areas. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, this is your time for questions and answers. Don't let me take all of it, or at least the ones that have been presented to me uh, up front here. Uh, but Mr. Peel, I'll come to you at this juncture. Um, if you could just underscore um, why, or what brother, why, what is special about nuclear science and technology for food provenance? Um, and why is a nuclear organization, why is it important that a nuclear organization is involved in that? I think sometimes we um, think that uh, nuclear science and technology applies to everything, and uh, in many ways it does. Uh, one of the questions here is uh, there, there's been a lot of work done in food provenance using 
techniques that people might not immediately think are nuclear science and technology related. So techniques like ICPMS, um, X-ray fluorescence and so on. So there's been many of these techniques used to do that basic method that I described of uh, building up a database and then being able to take individual samples and compare back to the database. I think the real secret source here is that when you bring the power of specific nuclear techniques, in particular isotopic fingerprinting, uh, isotope analysis, uh, then you can actually enrich those data sets significantly to the point where you have an accurate enough representation of your points of origin that you can then use quite, uh, for want of a better word, non-accurate methods like a handheld scanner. Uh, so it, it's really that underpinning uh, that allows um, simpler and cheaper uh, and faster techniques to be used, but it does rely on nuclear science and technology at its heart. Uh, Mr Mukta, does speed breeding, or is it appropriate for all plants, um, all types of plants, and does the technique affect the quality or the characteristics of the plants? Uh, so far, I think uh, uh, these have been uh, largely tested on uh, long day plants like uh, wheat. So the model has been very successful in uh, such crops and you can get four to five generation per year. Mm -hmm. So uh, for varietal development, uh, maybe you can reduce the time of variety development up to three to four years, mm -hmm. instead of 10 to, uh, 10 to 12 years. So, uh, but recently people have worked on short day plants also. So now protocols are being developed for these crops as well. So maybe in uh, near uh, future, so it will be available for any type of plant, which is economically important. And uh, what was your second uh, part? If it will affect the... No. Uh, the actually, it doesn't affect, uh, has any effect on genetics. Characteristics. Uh, uh, but it, uh, the, uh, the plants, they are uh, having uh, less vigor because they feel stressed when they are grown under certain climatic conditions. So the seeds they are produced, they are quite shriveled, but you can uh, get generation advancement. So that is the main purpose. It is not uh, to have a good yield out of those plants, but you just want to advance the generation. So that is the ultimately the objective is achieved. Okay. Any questions in the room before I come to Ms. Ellison? Because I have a question for you, but just to see. Okay, I see one question. Perhaps I'll ask her this one and then come back to the room. I just wanted you to say a few words, um, if you will, uh, Mr. Costa, about um, how the mechanisms that, that governments can employ to, to promote family farming. Um, uh, before uh, Lula uh, stay, again, friend of Brazil. And the first time is to make a planning. It is planning, um, is it have at the first point is that com uh, combat the hunger. Yes. This is, the, and all the ministries, all the ministries, for example, agriculture ministers, science and technology, education, health, and they are, all these ministers make a program, integrated uh, program, for example, for the this development of new equipments for the agriculture family, the family agriculture, and uh, in being insumes, for example, and uh, the farmer better I protect the 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 mechanisms, the the, the biodiversity, the ecosystems uh, in in globe, uh, the water, for example, is a problem now the, because the contamination in the in the country in the city because the for example the uh, all the the products you use the agribusiness is a problem you need uh, to think about this and the, the other uh, specific my ministry we have a, a a group of the call public call and the, the ECT university for example or research centers submit the, pro the propose mm -hmm. together the uh, enterprise, for example, and is obligatory 
you have uh, uh, the projects make it to plan it together the local communities. Yes. This is the, the difference of the other programs that you don't uh, look, don't uh, listen what the, the, the family, the woman in the, 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 the family in the, the farm think about the ex-stems locals. locals. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I have a question from the floor, from this side of the room, looking for another one. Okay, so I have one and two, and we'll do those. Thank you. Yes. Abdul from uh, TC Africa, the IEA. Um, uh, uh, just uh, reflecting on this forum, uh, food security, um, we are saying that uh, there is not enough food, yet we have uh, if my understanding is correct, to between 20 and 30 percent of food uh, is lost, post-harvest losses. Now, especially under this panel, we understand that food irrigation has been recognized really to be as an effective um, uh, method to improve uh, food uh, safety and to recover, to, 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 to really extend the shelf life. So in some way to reduce, um, to, to provide more food. Uh, my, my question is why, uh, knowing that it seems it is even simpler to do that than to, to, I mean, to recover what it is already here. What are the barriers then if really this technology is effective? Why it is not widespread? Um, is it, I mean, because uh, if, for, for, from the look of things, um, if really we listen to those presentation, um, there is nothing preventing from, from having the technology wide free and why they are not adopted worldwide already to, to recover what we have. So I, I'm really having that question and I, I, I would like to, to see maybe if the panel can, can, can say that. What, what are the constraints? Thank you. Thank you very much. And the question from Ms. Feng. Thank you very much. Uh, so my question, I think, is to all the speakers, at least for some of you. Uh, as you know, in fact, the agency has established a very sound or effective collaborative uh, mechanism with our counterparts in the country through the uh, AAEA collaborating centers. So, for example, uh, in uh, Texas and I, we have a collaborative center on uh, food irrigation. Uh, in Ghana, we have a collaborative center focusing on uh, mutation breeding, and uh, we have a very comprehensive collaborating center with NIAB in uh, Pakistan, and so on and so forth. So, my question to you is that, uh, from your perspective, what's uh, how can we really better use this uh, collaboration mechanism? to improve our collaboration in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, please, yeah. Uh, uh, volunteers, welcome. I'll, I'll answer that first question first and then come to her question. So the question is a very, uh, very, very important question. Why is not it happened so far? In my humble opinion, what has happened is most of the irradiation centers in the past uh, 65 years have been cobalt-60 irradiators in government establishments that were limited by the amount of radioactivity that was there. So it was not widespread, it was not used widespread, okay? It was not as widespread in use as possible, as it could have been. And now with the advent of electron beam and X-ray technologies, that, that paradigm is shifting. More and more countries, more and more businesses are able to acquire the technology uh, at a faster space, especially if you look at Southeast Asia, it is moving very fast. India is moving very fast. They are all adopting the technology, multi-purpose irradiation facilities where they do food and other applications. In the West, in the in United States, the businesses have understood that the value proposition of this addition of this technology to food is less than that of sterilizing medical supplies. So most of the electron beam and X-ray facilities in the United States and Western Europe are all going towards medical device sterilization and not towards food. But the second flush of, of, of facilities that are coming in is for food. For example, in Mexico, the one that was recently built in Aguas Calientes is primarily designed for food, for, not for export. This is very important for the domestic, uh, domestic use. So that it is a, and this technology is relatively new in terms of 
commercially robust technologies? I hope that answers some part of your question. To your question, um, what the collaborating centers do, what we have done and what we take a little bit of pride at Texas is that we helped the businesses open up these, uh, educate the entrepreneurs to open up businesses in Mexico. Electron Beam, we spent a lot of time developing workshops and outreach activities. So I think at Texas A&M, I can speak for my center, is that we can serve as a very good place for countries and uh, people to come and look at how an electron facility operates at a commercial scale. And the U.S. government has supported us extensively in enabling that uh, so that Country, uh, when we talk about countries like we have done feasibility studies for about seven or eight countries that are going on, and they are now understanding what does it cost to invest in the technology, what does it cost in terms of uh, per hour usage of it, how do you have electrical resiliency, etc. So there's a lot of work that the collaborating center still needs to do. For example, outreach, technical research projects. There are some questions that we still do not know because the questions have not been raised so far. Comparison of electron beam efficacy versus cobalt in certain applications, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done by collaborating centers. To my other panelists, if you want to also volunteer some answers because there wasn't a single one of you a singled out, so to say. So, Mr. Osei. Yes, um, thank you very much. So um, in the area of plant breeding and genetics, for example, we can um, leverage on the collaborating center to actually work together to assess the needs of the region. For example, what are the fo uh, food security needs of, of um, most of the countries in Africa? What are the challenges that face um, the crops that we, 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 we rely on for food security? Is it pest or disease? For example, in Africa, um, cassava brown streak virus disease is a major problem. Can we have a collaborative pro project to to develop resistant varieties for cassava brown streak virus uh, resistant. Um, Ghana is working on a project like that. Kenya is working on a project like that. Can we serve as a hub to develop varieties that can be disseminated to the areas that this uh, um, um, uh, disease is prevalent? And then also the collaborating centers can serve as a hub for training and capacity building, where um, people from the region can be sent for training and, and my institute serves as a hub where a lot of people from other parts of Africa come for training in mutation breeding and, gene and genetics. So um, we can leverage on that um, to even train more people to be able to apply these technologies um, uh, in the member states on, on the continent. Thank you. Um, this, this may sound a little simple, but I think one of the key things that we sometimes forget in the concept of collaborating centres is the word collaboration. Uh, and one of the things we've found, not just in collaborating centres, but in many um, key projects, uh, is that unless there is that true collaboration, unless there is true input from all partners, uh, then they'll, they'll not necessarily be doomed to failure, but they will not be as effective uh, as they otherwise could be. So uh, as one example, uh, in the Australian context, uh, we have a pretty terrible history uh, of doing one-way programs with uh, Indigenous populations uh, and working with First Nations people, uh, working with First Nations people is proving to be a much more um, successful approach uh, where there is true ownership uh, from the recipients. So the Kakadu Plum Project, for instance, that's something that was largely initiated from the, the regional growers looking for uh, capabilities and techniques and then working hand, uh, hand in glove uh, with the, with the, the um, food provenance techniques. So I think that's a model that um, should be first and foremost in mind when, when thinking about how to get the most out of collaborating centres. Thank you very much. Mr. Mukta. So uh, last year, uh, one of our institutes, Nuclear Institute for Agriculture and Biology at uh, Neaf Faisalabad, uh, it was declared as uh, IAEA Collaborating Centre. And since then, we have been involved in uh, organising different training programmes. And uh, almost uh, 12, 13 participants from different countries, especially from Africa, they visited uh, NEAP for training on uh, optimization of uh, radiation dose for different crops. So we are offering all sorts of training in uh, uh, radiation, in food safety, in soil water management, 
and uh, uh, Moreover, we are uh, we were asked by some uh, colleagues from IAEA to uh, uh, share uh, mutated germplasm with uh, uh, if it is required by someone, and we have proposed a center for uh, mutated germplasm over there in Faisalabad. So we'll be sharing that as well. But uh, our uh, labs are open for anyone uh, who want to come over there for training, for any collaboration, and things like that. I think we'll leave it here for today. Thank you, everybody. That does it for our session. Mr. Yao Ose, Ms. Ellison, Mr. Peel. Professor Pillai, Mr. Mukta, Mr. Costa, thank you so much uh, for your presentations and also for your engaging uh, input now. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for staying the course. That does it for this session as well as for day one of our scientific, uh, of our scientific forum. We're back tomorrow morning, 9.30 in here, and we'll uh, commence with our third session. Uh, and that will be followed by our closing session. Uh, but I think there's a lot to just take in from today's input. Um, we could still do some networking, I imagine, but looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow. And again, thank you. Please help me give them a round of applause for their uh, contributions this afternoon. Thank you also to all our other speakers who might still be in the room. And yes, yeah, see you all tomorrow morning.